Hello everybody and welcome to the Tuesday edition of Video Clips and as usual I have some announcements. Um, first of all, do remember that we are posting on other platforms like Parlor and BitChute. Um, I think you know why I'm telling you that in case anything should happen here. Uh, second thing is MakeAmericansFreeAgain.com. Make sure you go there, sign in, join our movement. Um, I'm posting a new video there this week, uh, which I think you'll want to see. And we're also doing conference calls um, today at one o'clock, depends on when you're watching this, whether or not that's going to work out. Uh, Wednesday, September 2nd at 9 p.m. Eastern and Sunday, September 6th at 7 p.m. Eastern. Um, I'll do as many of these as I need to. Um, I do a big brief introduction and then people can ask questions. We had our first session uh, yesterday. Um, I'm filming this on a Thursday for the following week and it was... Um, it was really wonderful, like lots of great questions and lots of people very excited about the things that I had to tell them. Uh, so um, make sure you're signed in and you've joined our movement. We're already doing some really exciting things. I think you're gonna to wanna to be part of it. And I think you're gonna be happy about the kinds of problems that we're solving on behalf of everybody. Um, yesterday's newsletter article, always about something that it's harder to talk about on YouTube. So if you would like to get that newsletter article, become a subscriber and we'll send you some of the past issues of the COVID collection. Pam Popper at msn.com. And then remember careers and, um, and uh, studying at home to have a career, doing something like what we do here at Wellness Forum Health, which is informed decision-making. Um, we offer a couple of career track programs. One is the equivalent of a dietetics degree, but more focus on scientific nutrition than, than some of the food service management and things that um, people in our crowd generally are not very interested in. And then we have some training programs for people who um, want to get more into the consulting end of it, like we are, uh, people who are already trained as health professionals and looking to change careers, and then people who have have no training whatsoever and we'll be starting from scratch we have something for any and all of you and um, I'm happy to if you send me an email send you some information and schedule a chance to talk with you on the phone these are important decisions and we want to make sure that you um, sign up for the program that you want and you're getting what you want out of it and all that sort of thing so feel free to send me an email Pam Popper at msn.com um, so um, let's go on ahead and I've got a couple of things that I want to cover today. Um, but first of all, I want to tell you, we finished writing our book. Uh, my co-author and I, Shane Pryor, we finished writing the book. We're in the editing stage now. So we're in the countdown to being able to tell you when it will be ready. It's called COVID Operation. What happened, why it happened, and what's next. So can't wait until it's time to uh, let you have that book. We're pretty proud of it and um, excited to have it released very soon. All right, so here's what I want to talk about today. There is a lot of conversation going on, um, well, about all kinds of COVID-related stuff for sure. But one thing is how long are you immune if you've had COVID and are the tests picking up fragments of virus that were there before from previous infections and all that sort of thing. And so um, I think it's really important to tell you that the first part of the information I'm going to share with you today came from Francis Collins blog and he is the director of the National Institutes of Health. So to the extent that we can share with you the data that comes out of our government agencies, I think that that sort of frames the issue best. If you know what I mean. So um, he says on his blog, much of the study on the immune response to COVID-19 is focused on the production of antibodies, but immune cells known as memory T cells can also play an important role in the ability of our immune systems to protect us against many viral infections, including COVID-19. So he reports a new study of these memory T cells suggests that they might protect some people against COVID-19 by remembering past encounters with other coronaviruses. This could explain why some people tend to fend off the virus and be less susceptible to becoming severely ill. It also explains all the asymptomatic people who are testing positive when they do um, population screening or community screening, which has happened since March. That's been going on. The study was done by Antonio Bertoletti, an expert in viral infections at Duke University. It was published in the journal Nature. So we're getting this information from the head of the NIH. Um, we have um, an expert at Duke University published in a prestigious medical journal. So I don't think that we can argue with it very much. 
Um, Bartoletti's team recognized that many factors could help to explain how a single virus can cause respiratory, circulatory, and other symptoms that vary widely, and uh, both in terms of their nature and their severity, um, which is acquiring prior immunity to other closely related viruses. And so it's important to realize, and he says it on his blog, that COVID-19 belongs to a large family of coronaviruses, six of which have been known to infect humans. Four of them are responsible for the common cold. In other words, coronaviruses in general don't tend to be very dangerous. The other two are a little bit more dangerous. SARS-CoV-1, the virus responsible for SARS, um, which ended in 2004, and MERS-CoV, the virus that caused the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, or MERS, first identified in Saudi Arabia in 2012. All six of these previously known coronaviruses spark production of both antibodies and these memory T cells, and most likely the coronavirus, the COVID-19, does as well. In addition, studies of immunity to COVID-19 have shown that T cells stick around for many more years than acquired antibodies. The researchers gathered blood samples from 36 people who'd recently recovered from mild to severe COVID-19. And in these samples, they found T cells that recognize and respond to multiple parts of SARS-CoV-2, the virus that we're uh, referring to as COVID-19. Next, they look at blood samples from 23 people who'd survived SARS. The studies show that these individuals still had lasting memory T cells 17 years after the outbreak. Those memory T cells acquired in response to SARS-CoV-1 also recognize parts of SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19. Finally, Bertoletti's team looked for those T cells in blood samples for 37, um, from 37 individuals with no history of either COVID-19 or SARS. And to their surprise, more than half had T cells that recognized one or more of COVID-19 proteins. It's still not clear if this acquired immunity stems from previous infection with coronaviruses that caused the common cold, for example, or perhaps exposure to other as yet unknown coronaviruses. In other words, um, coronaviruses have been with us for a long, long time and they mutate and there are a bunch of them out there. We just happen to be talking about one all the time right now. But here's the most important thing. I found this on um, uh, uh, Collins's blog. And then I don't really like to report something when there's only one study that says it. I've always felt that you have to have some type of verification or validation from other sources. So I started looking for other studies as well, and I found them. In labs all over the world, actually, scientists are finding the same thing. Um, in one study, uh, a group of scientists in Germany reported that out of 68 healthy donors who had been tested for prior exposure to COVID-19 and were found to be negative, 24 of them had a small number of T cells in their blood that reacted when they were uh, exposed to the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, a complex structure protruding from the virus's exterior surface, surface which allows it to infect cells. And so these T cells were, re were reacting to that. If that's indeed what's going on here, one possible explanation would be that the healthy donors had been infected by another coronavirus relatively recently, perhaps one that causes the common cold, says co-author Andreas Thiel, an immunologist at the Charity Hospital, part of, um, I can't even pronounce this, university in Berlin. Besides more serious diseases like COVID-19 and SARS, human coronaviruses have been known for decades to cause what are usually much milder infections. The specific viruses that cause these illnesses are found all over the world. And so I find what's really interesting is not only that multiple groups, I'm going to report on one more, are finding this, but that you have these very um, accomplished researchers who keep referring to coronaviruses as pretty harmless. We're exposed to them all the time. Most of us have had at least a couple if we're my age at 63, etc. Um, the researcher went on to say, although these viruses are not very similar to SARS-CoV-2, the low degree of similarity is all you need for the immune system to be able to respond. It just has to be a little bit like, and then our immune systems are so smart that they say, huh, we've seen something like this before, so we know what to do, and they take care of it. Pre-existing immunity might not be limited to T cells. A preprint published on July 23rd reports that COVID-19 reactive antibodies were found in blood samples taken from people in the UK between 2018 and 2020 before anybody was even talking about COVID-19. 
Not only did the authors find that people who had never had COVID-19 have IgG antibodies reactive with certain SARS-CoV-2 proteins, but further tests showed that these antibodies did have a neutralizing effect on the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein that I referred to earlier. It's kind of unique about this particular coronavirus, and it's the thing that allows the coronavirus to infect cells. So this suggests that these antibodies might be able to be protective against COVID-19. And so again, when community testing has been done, for example, by one of the research groups at Stanford, there was another group that did it in New York, they continue to find all kinds of people testing positive, um, the, you know, finding antibodies to SARS-CoV-2 but who were completely asymptomatic, got it, got the virus, never had anything happen, recovered from it, and you know, complete, no, it was a non-event, all right? And I have reason to believe that I did too, because I was exposed to somebody who I think had it back in the early part of the year, so, and I didn't get sick, so anyway, um, I digress a little bit. One of the most striking findings was that these antibodies were far more prevalent in children between the ages of 1 and 16 years old. In fact, 60% of the children had these neutralizing IgG antibodies. Co-author Rupert Beale, an immunologist at the Francis Crick Institute in London, remarked on Twitter that this particular result was completely unexpected, kind of a bombshell, as he put it. In the preprint, the authors write that the kids are generally more frequently exposed to other coronaviruses, uh, such as those that could cause common colds, which is why so many kids have these IgG antibodies in their bloodstream. So the bottom line and the takeaway point from all of this is that a lot of us in the general population have already developed an auto immunity to uh, COVID-19. And um, the fact that so many kids, such a high percentage of the kids already had uh, demonstrated antibodies and, or, um, uh, antibodies and demonstrated immunity to COVID-19 uh, COVID-19 indicates that we really, this whole business of the way that the schools are functioning right now is, is actually nonsense and we need to stop this, but that doesn't, we call it COVID land. There's a, I'll just back up and tell you, in our book, there's a chapter called Life in COVID land because it's like landing on a different planet every day when you get out of bed. I'm sure you guys kind of feel this way too. It's just um, all the rules are different, nothing that makes sense applies. And, and so uh, I don't think that the National Institutes of Health director and his uh, blog and all these other studies are gonna make much of a difference, but they actually should. One last thing I wanted to cover today, somebody sent me this and, I, and I, it's just so concerning to me on so many levels. Um, what it is, it's a, I printed this out, it's from SurveyMonkey. You get these surveys all the time, um, and I, I don't have the time to mess around with them usually unless it's something really interesting to me or if I have a really strong opinion about it. But uh, the bottom line is that this particular person who sent this filled out a survey, answered the questions, and then at the end, um, when you're finished, what popped up on the screen is, how are you feeling? Contribute your health status to help track the COVID-19 pandemic. Start the survey, and you click on this thing. SurveyMonkey is partnering with COVID Near You, a team of epidemiologists and software developers at Harvard, Boston Children's Hospital, and volunteers from the technology industry. Survey, SurveyMonkey is acting solely as a service provider to COVID Near You with respect to the above survey. For additional information on how they treat personal health information and data, please visit Privacy Policy. My advice, do not fill this out. I would not fill anything like this out. This is how the um, creeps they refer to as contact tracers and health department employees find people and ruin their lives, all right? So how much they can ruin your life depends on what state you're in, but ruining your life seems to be what some of these people have in mind for their jollies every day. So I would not fill out anything like this. Um, I said before, I live rather limited life right now because I'm not interested in mask wearing and I'm not interested in playing around with these shenanigans. There's nothing I want in the world, nor is there anything that I need right now that, um, except for going to the grocery store and I can navigate that without uh, much trouble um, and coming to work. And I have to worry about here because I get to decide what goes on here, but there's nothing that I want or need right now that can't wait until after this mess is over. And um, stay tuned for announcements in the next few weeks, a few days, maybe even this week, because um, this might be over sooner than we know. All right, that's all for now. As usual, pass this on to somebody who you think might enjoy getting educated about this and other issues. And I will be back to you tomorrow with more news.